Welcome to Distressed to Joyful, Bailey's Way. I'm your host, Bailey Raber, here to enlighten you and the rest of the world about one of the most misunderstood mental disorders out there, bipolar disorder. Each week, we're going to learn more about my personal journey with the disorder while leaving you enriched with new information on how you can help better yourself as well as those around you. Warning, this episode is likely going to get a little weird. For the conservative, closed-minded individual out there who may be listening, please consider the following. This episode is based upon my past experiences as well as my current opinion on the following topic. Again, these are opinions and we each have a right to our own. If at any point you find yourself becoming filled with rage, please do yourself a favor and exit this podcast. There are facts sprinkled among the opinions spoken about throughout the show, which have been backed by research. You can find these links in the show notes on my website. You have been warned. So last week we talked about my debut on the party scene as a 16 year old. And this week we're going to talk about, yep, you guessed it, my first experiences with Mary Jane aka marijuana so this is a very controversial controversial excuse me controversial subject these days considering that recreational marijuana is legal for adults 21 or over in 11 of the 50 states and medical marijuana is legal in 33 of the 50 states so here goes nothing all right, the first time I ever tried it was actually before I even entered high school, which probably sounds a little crazy, but it's actually not as crazy as you may think. Per an article I found on VeryWellMind.com, 53% of people over the age of 18 have reported first trying marijuana between the ages of 12 and 17. Which, I'm not going to call it marijuana anymore, guys. We're just going to use the term weed. I honestly hate saying marijuana. I think it sounds super weird. Not my favorite flavor of words. I mean, there's so many out there, but we're not. We're going to stick with weed from here on out. Alright, like I mentioned, the article said that over half of the population that they spoke with, who was over the age of 18, said that they first tried it between the ages of 12 and 17. And that is exactly where I fall as I tried it for the very first time at the age of bum 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 14. It was the summer before my freshman year of high school and I was looking for a final thrill of the summer before entering high school. In case you forgot, I was a bored thrill seeking small town teenager. Plus, in case I haven't already mentioned this, I was always told what I could and couldn't do. So anything that I wasn't allowed to do totally intrigued me and caused me to want to do it even more. Even if I hadn't even considered the idea previously. So I'm going to pause on the weed talk for a second and go in a little bit deeper on what I just said. Anything that I wasn't allowed to do intrigued me specifically because I was told not to do it with absolutely no explanation or reasoning as to why I shouldn't. Drugs, sex before marriage, and drinking alcohol were the biggest of those things I was not allowed to do. So with that being said, if you're listening and you're a parent, whether your child is 2 or 12, I strongly suggest that you work on open communication with them. Dude, I wish I could scream that out to all of the parents around the world. And although my voice is probably loud enough to actually reach Tokyo, I'd rather save your eardrums. And you can thank me later for that. But in all seriousness, think about it. Telling somebody, no, you can't do that, is a shutdown statement. Especially if you don't follow up with anything after you say, no, you can't do that. If you draw the line there, You're just shutting down whatever the thought or the idea was. Which, while I agree that it is sometimes necessary, 
In the eyes of a kid or a teenager, it makes them think, okay, but why? Why can't I do that? Okay, so not all teenagers think like that, but most of them are probably thinking that exact thing right there. Why? Why can't I do it? As soon as they hear the word no, and although they might not verbalize their curiosity, they might still seek out the activity anyways. I was definitely a curious cat, and I still am to this day, actually. So while I verbalized my quest for reasonings as to why I shouldn't or couldn't do something, I was often met with, because I said so. Y'all, my parents did a really good job of raising me for the most part, but I have to comment on that method right there because that was literally the worst way to handle a situation for a hard conversation. Think about it. Especially considering that being the curious cat that I am, not knowing why I couldn't do something made me want to do it even more. It kind of felt like a game, like I was searching for some kind of hidden treasure or pleasure behind the act. Like, okay, I can't do this. There's got to be a reason. And it's probably a good reason, right? Or maybe it's bad reason. Either way, I'm about to find out since they won't tell me, right? Open communication was not a thing in my house growing up. And so hard conversations just didn't happen, which then resulted in me engaging in sex alcohol, and smoking weed to find out why I shouldn't be doing so. Which leads me right back to where we left off. Me smoking some weed at the age of 14. Now, let's get to my take on it. So, the first time I smoked was with a group of friends. I was staying the night with one of them, but we ended up heading over to her grandma's house who was out of town at the time. Sneaky and totally worked because we never got caught. From what I remember, we all sat around in a circle, passed around a joint, and chatted while smoking it. I remember laughing uncontrollably at really stupid shit and then getting the munchies. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with weed culture, getting the munchies is a common side effect of smoking where you basically feel violently hungry and just consume everything in sight. Most of what you're consuming is just straight junk food. So then when the friends who weren't staying the night left, the last three of us put on a movie from the late 80s called Labyrinth. And that was an awful idea. If you haven't seen it, I do not recommend it, especially after smoking a joint. Y'all, that movie creeped me out. But thankfully, I fell asleep shortly after it was put on probably because of all the food I ate and it was the time being I think it was like three or four in the morning something crazy like that so all in all this experience was nothing compared to the crazy party days that would later follow this was literally getting high and chilling and to be honest this is probably what I should have been doing instead of drinking because I am not a chill person I have often been told to take a chill pill, so had I chosen to be a stoner kid instead of a party kid, maybe my life would have turned out way differently, who knows. Okay, but here's where things get tricky when it comes to the topic of marijuana. I mean weed. Anyways, yes, it is legal in 11 states, but only for ages 21 and over, and y'all I'm here for it. I am totally here for it. But what I'm not here for is doing so while under the legal age. And here's why. That same article that I mentioned earlier from Very Well Mind states, Marijuana use may precede depression. Research from 2006 shows girls ages 14 to 15 who used marijuana daily were five times more likely to face depression by age 21. Daily use in young women was associated with an over five-fold increase in the odds of reporting a state of depression and anxiety. 
So coming from someone who's had many, many spells of depression throughout her teenage and early 20 years, I highly recommend that you do whatever you can to avoid it, which boils down to this. Smoking weed should not become an activity that you engage in until you're old enough to do so and also in a state where it is legal or a country where it's legal at that. But this article goes on to say a lot more about the drug and the dangers behind the use of it. But this so-called drug that weed is should be the least of everyone's worries. So let's talk about what we should be worrying about when it comes to the drug scene. And that's going to be the harder stuff. And by harder stuff, I mean cocaine, heroin, and meth. Now, before you freak out or get all judgy on me, I have not engaged with these harder substances, so I can't give you an insider's perspective on them. So go ahead and just breathe. It's okay. Calm down and just keep listening to what I have to say, okay? <laughs> now, I'm sure you've heard the term that marijuana is a gateway drug before, right? And if not, then just check out the link in episode 10's show notes on my blog. And you can watch a short video of doctors debating if marijuana is a gateway drug or not on CNN. Now, I definitely agree with the conclusion that it is, in fact, not a gateway drug. And I have plenty of reason to believe so, both from my own experience with it as well as the experiences of others. But the reason why I want to talk a little bit more about the harder drugs is because I recently found out, okay, well, recently being like two years ago, whatever, close enough, that my little old hometown has a big problem with meth users. And y'all, hearing that shit both blew my mind and also saddened my heart at the same time, especially when I found out that one of the girls that I used to party and drink with all the time ended up in rehab for a meth addiction. That is scary, y'all. So scary because I have absolutely no idea when she started using it. It could have been long after we stopped hanging out or it could have started happening while we were friends and I just had no idea. And in case you don't know much about meth, or its scientific term is a methamphetamine. Let me relay a few facts right quick found from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Again, the link can be found in the show notes on the blog. Methamphetamine, aka meth, increases the natural chemical dopamine in the brain, which affects motivation, body movement, and reinforcing of rewarding behaviors. The drug's ability to rapidly increase high levels of dopamine in reward areas of the brain strongly reinforces drug-taking behavior, making the user want to repeat the experience. So that last sentence is very technical in all of the ways that the words are being thrown around in the sentence. But what it's basically saying is that the drug gives you a high very quickly and the high doesn't last long. So it reinforces the brain's desire to continue the same process, aka making it a highly addictive substance. Short-term effects include increased physical activity, less need for sleep, rapid breathing, decreased appetite, rapid heartbeat, and increased blood pressure and body temperature. Long-term side effects include higher risk for contracting infectious diseases such as HIV, hepatitis B and C. And the use of meth can also alter your judgment and decision making leading to risky behaviors such as unprotected sex, which will also increase the risk for the infectious diseases that I just mentioned. So if you're not too worried about catching those diseases, let's think about some of the other long-term effects that can come from using meth. Extreme weight loss, the addiction to it, which guys, if you've never dealt with anyone in your personal life who struggles with addiction, 
addiction is probably one of the worst diseases out there. And I say that addiction is a disease because I have heard that from psychologists and psychiatrists around the world that they believe that an addiction is a disease. And I agree. It's where your brain is just triggered and you have to have that thing. And if you'll do anything that you can to have it. And that's the scary part is that these people who are addicted, whether it be to meth or heroin or cocaine, I know this is a super sidetrack from all of the long-term effects, but I just have to pause and talk about the addiction part real fast, is that willing to do anything for the drug means they will steal from you and your family and the neighbors. They'll break into cars. They will do whatever they can to get the money in order to get the drug. But they're not going to be able to hold a stable job to afford the lifestyle habits of it. I mean, think about it. Have you ever worked with anybody that had a serious drug addiction? No. I mean, a lot of places do drug testing. So first of all, they'd have to pass that, which they would already fail. But even so, if you work in an environment where they don't do drug testing, it's really hard for somebody who is addicted to a substance to maintain a, a job or anything stable in their life because drugs cause so much instability. And again, when I say drugs, I do not mean weed. I do not mean marijuana. I will never categorize that as a drug, and that is my own personal opinion. But guys, things like this, just they just destroy lives. They destroy the person who has the addiction. It destroys that person's life, but it also destroys the lives of the people closely related or involved with the addictee's life. I think that made sense. Yeah. Basically, it just destroys everything in its path, and it's awful. It's like a wildfire in California. If you have never seen a video about that, there is a Netflix documentary. I cannot remember the name of it for the life of me right now. Maybe it's called Fire. That sounds a little too generic. But basically, when a wildfire comes through, it literally just destroys everything in its path. And that is what addiction does. I hope that gave you a good visual. But back to the long-term side effects of methamphetamines. It also causes severe dental problems known as meth mouth. And I'm sure some of you out there have not necessarily seen meth mouth firsthand, which I guess a couple of you probably have. But y'all, meth mouth is a thing. If you've never seen it or heard of it, just Google it. Be prepared for some horrific photos. But if you are brave enough and unsure of what meth mouth is, I want you to look that up right now. Just like while you're listening to me talk, just Google it. Again, I warned you, it's not for the weak stomachs or the faint of heart. Also, a bunch of other side effects include anxiety, changes in brain structure and function, confusion, memory loss, sleeping problems, violent behavior, paranoia, which if anybody doesn't know what that is, paranoia is extreme and unreasonable distrust of others. So basically, like you think everybody's out to get you when actually nobody's out to get you. And then you start to do irrational things because you are so stuck in your mind that everybody's just out to get you. It's a wild concept. And then also, meth can cause hallucinations, which I assume everybody knows what that is, but a hallucination is you seeing something or hearing something that is not actually there. Now, if that whole list wasn't enough to, like, you know, scare your pants off about the thought of using meth, the last thing I'm going to mention that it does is it affects the cognitive part of the brain. I think I said that right. Oh no, it can cause emotional and cognitive problems and also impair verbal learning. 
all of that being said, guys, these are the things that meth does to you. And guys, this isn't stuff that the D.A.R.E. program from school taught you. Or that President Reagan's failed Just Say No campaign spoke about. No, these are things that I researched on my own time in order to gain a better understanding as well as to just simply educate myself on the topic. So you're probably wondering why I took the time to research this. Okay, so first of all, just remember how I mentioned that an old friend of mine ended up in rehab for a meth addiction, right? And the reality of the fact that that could have been me instead of her hit me really hard. And it haunted me, guys. It it literally haunted me. Like, how did she end up there and I'm here living a healthy life, right? So the fact is, back when I mentioned marijuana being a gateway drug, and that has always been a... Okay, not always. That's the Reagan's Just Say No campaign coming out, thinking that marijuana is a gateway drug in the 60s and 70s and 80s and whatever. That was before Reagan's time, I'm pretty sure. This whole timeline got screwed up, but I'm sure you're following me. Hopefully. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, research has shown that the use of these harder substances, being cocaine, heroin, and meth, are not a result from smoking weed, but they show that it is actually a, res a result from the social environment that you are exposed to. Let me say that one more time so it can kind of like sit very well with you. Marijuana doesn't lead to experimenting with harder drugs. Harder drugs come about based upon the social environment that you are in. Breaking that down, that means if you hang out with people who do meth, heroin, and or cocaine, maybe they do a slew of all of them, I don't know, you are a hell of a lot more likely to try on these drugs. Try on. <laughs> They're not close. To try out these drugs. Whereas if you just hang out with a bunch of stoners, then you'll probably just stick with smoking weed like the rest of the stoners and be on with your happy high self. I think that when I found that in the research I've done on this topic, that's what really, really got me thinking about, like, okay, social environment. It got me thinking about that friend, y'all. Like, she ended up a meth addict, and I didn't. So I'm going to assume that she started hanging out with different people after she and I stopped hanging out, and those are the people that introduced her to meth. But honestly, I can't be sure. We hung out with some shady ass people who did some weird things. And again, I said earlier that my hometown has a huge problem with meth users. Like it's now, I guess, coming into light, I should say. It's probably been happening longer than anybody's realized. But so that could have easily been me. Had I met the wrong person who offered me it, and had I decided to give it a try because I needed another thrill-seeking thing checked off my list, you know? If any of y'all grew up in the 2000s, you may remember D.A.R.E. where they would say, they would tell you, like, you know, just say no to drugs and alcohol. This is what it'll do to you. All they would tell us is things like, it'll fry your brain up like an egg on a frying pan. And that's kind of how they left it. They tried to scare you and use like a fear tactic in order to dissuade you from trying out drugs if you were ever offered. But that showed that it, it failed. That program failed. And again, just telling people not to do something without giving them good reason why they should not. That was the problem with that campaign. And in my opinion, that's also the problem with teaching abstinence. We are not going to cover that topic today. That is, again, another hard, touchy topic, and we're going to stick to today's scheduled program. But <laughs> that's, in my opinion, that's just very, very similar concept. It just doesn't work. It doesn't. But back to that friend of mine who spent some time in rehab. So... Rehab means a couple of things. 
It means either months or years of your life lost in order to try to gain back some sense of normality. It means a harder time finding a decent job in a field that you want once you're well again. It means relying on your friends and or family to support you both emotionally and financially during these times. And rehab just means a lot of general instability in your life. And if you have never met anybody who's been to rehab, then I will tell you firsthand as someone who has been affected directly by someone who has gone to rehab that they usually go more than once. Rehab is usually a last straw type of thing, but they'll go in and they'll start to get the help that they need to get back to a healthier life. And then something will happen and they relapse and they go back to the drug using or alcohol or whatever it is. And then they get back into rehab and it guys, it's a vicious cycle. It is a vicious cycle and it can be broken, but the person who goes into rehab has to really, really want to break it. And they have to put in the work and the effort. Does that sound something like you'd want to do? Does that sound fun to you? I think that last sentence I just said, I think was very parental figure sounding. And I kind of hope it was in the sense that maybe it scared anybody who's thought about playing around with recreational drugs. But seriously, I mean, if you want to spend your life unstable at going in and out of rehabs, looking for jobs that you will never keep, sleeping on people's couches, asking other people to help pay your bills, if that's what you want to do with your life, sure, go right on ahead. Ain't nobody stopping you. But my hope for you is that if you do decide to experiment with smoking some weed, please just wait until you are over the age of 21 and do so in an environment where it is legal. Now, as for the harder drugs, I really, really hope that that is something that you won't even consider after hearing everything that I've just had to say. I hope that if these words that I have spoken today didn't scare you, that they at least resonated inside you so deeply that if you were ever in a situation where you were asked or pressured into trying cocaine, heroin, or meth, that you would have the strength and the wisdom to just not do it and to just completely walk away from that situation and that environment right then and there. Because it's not worth it. It's not. Well, that was a heavy topic that had some twists and turns to it. I'm sure that some of y'all really weren't expecting all of that today. But thank you for joining me and listening in. So next week, we're going to go more in depth on the effects of alcohol and drug abuse with somebody diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I know today's episode, we talked just basically about, not basically, we only talked about drugs and the recreational use behind them and also about the recreational use of marijuana, which is great. This is great information. But I think next week we're going to need to go in depth on how it affects anybody who has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Because unfortunately, for those of us who have been diagnosed, alcohol and drug use affects us a lot differently than it affects a, you know, a human that's not been diagnosed with this disorder. If you enjoy today's show, or any of the episodes for that matter, Leave us a review. Help others understand why you love it and why you think they should hop on the bandwagon with listening in. Also, don't forget to follow distressed to joyful underscore Bailey's Way on Instagram so you can stay updated with the latest information pertaining to the show. And you can find the show notes for this episode on my blog, which is what is hay bales. Hay bales is spelled H-E-Y-B-A-I-L-S, doing, so what is hay bales doing, dot wordpress, dot com. But until next time, take it easy, 
stay grateful and be joyful. Bye.